Jeff Mixer works as a senior product manager at OCLC and oversees linked data products and services. Today, he's going to talk about tangible advancements in linked data, what we've achieved over the past year. Jeff, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. So I hope uh, everyone can see my slides all right. Um, so again, yeah, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to uh, present today. Um, my name is Jeff Mixter. Um, I work at OCLC as a senior product manager for our linked data products and services. Um, and today I was going to give a quick overview of um, what I've been doing in my role over the past couple of years and how we've uh, taken all the the work we've done with libraries around the world and started to turn it into sort of uh, tangible advancements that uh, libraries, regardless of whether whether where they are on their linked data journey, uh, can start using linked data in their workflows uh, today. So um, I joined uh, the product team about uh, just over two years ago, and the first thing I really uh, started working on was um, understanding um, what challenges libraries are facing right now. Um, and those are challenges not only associated with you know sort of linked data interest, but just using metadata in general. Um, so previously to my time uh, in uh, product, I was in our research division working for about a decade on linked data research and development. Um, so I understood the technicalities of linked data very well um, and um, sort of being uh, an evangelist, if you will, for linked data, um, my, my general opinion was we should just do it to do it. It's the thing we need to do. Um, but journey product, uh, what I was um, uh, started diving more into is why. Why are we doing this? And the why can't just be because LinkedIn is awesome. We should all go there. Um, it can't be an ends in and in and of itself. It needs to be a means to an end. And um, the ends are actually challenges that libraries have right now um, and see moving forward. So um, at a very high level, um, you know, sort of working with and talking with libraries, uh, librarians around the world, um, sort of these are the challenges um, that we sort of boiled down all of our conversations to. Um, and it's sort of there's an increasingly complex and messy hybrid of environments, whether that be authorities, marked bibliographic and linked data, or just marked bibliographic and sort of linked data bibliographic. There's just all, and then it's not just cataloging data, it's cataloging data, research information management data, theses and dissertation, digital collections. There's just a large environment of data um, that librarians are increasingly um, becoming more and more responsible for. Um, across that data, there's a disparate set of identifiers. Um, so there's you know, ISNIs, ORCIDs, uh, we were just talking about BIAFs, uh, Wikidata, um, LCNAFs, so there's just a, a cacophony of different identifiers. Um, that are used to represent similar things. Abraham Lincoln is in every single one of those aforementioned um, identifier namespaces. Um, and that's challenging to then manage at scale. Um, there's a lack of tools for supporting sort of unified cataloging environments. Um, so whether that be a hybrid linked data mark record, whether that be a hybrid authority um, bibliographic sort of environment, um, there's just a, a general lack of tools. Um, relating to the first two, there's this inability for data to serve multiple workflows. So my catalog data does what it does. My researcher information management data does what it does. But what I really need to do is have those data sets work together to solve X or Y. Um, and you know, the primary example there is discovery. I need to pull back all of the resources associated with a person. Um, and that person has resources in our catalog in our researcher information management system, in our digital collections, in our um, you know, other, other variety of data systems we have across campus. And pulling back all of that information is challenging right now. Um, and in general, there's just an absence of an ecosystem um, to, to manage all of this information, whether that be identifiers, the actual data itself, uh, linked data moving forward. Um, so these are the challenges that um, we've been hearing about and talking about over the past couple of years. Um, and we've also um, sort of um, talked about libraries as to where they are on their leaked data journey. Um, and there's sort of what I'd like to broadly say, sort of three, three broad categories. Um, the, the first category is the, the sort of the vanguard, the one doing it now, the early adopters. Um, they're you know, either on the verge and converting to a whole linked data, a wholly linked data system, or in some cases they're already there, but they are the ones 
really pushing for adopting all the great work that's come out of LD4, that's come out of sort of the bid frame initiative. Uh, you know, these are the 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 the, um, the the libraries doing it right now. Um, the second group is libraries who are what I like to say sort of dipping their toes in the linked data environment. So they want to start integrating linked data into certain workflows, uh, but they're maybe not quite ready to wholly, you know, move past their mark records into something like Bidframe or RDA, RDF. Um, so they want they want to sh they want to see the value, they want to demonstrate the value, and they want to use that value within their current workflows, um, most of which are mark based right now. And then the third category is libraries who have been hearing people talk about linked data in the library domain for the past 15, 20 years um, and just want to do it, but don't know where to start. Um, they don't have the staff training. Uh, they don't have the uh, funds. The, the systems don't exist yet that work in it. So you know, these libraries really want to learn more and also, again, be able to demonstrate the value to stakeholders um, at their library or within their community or wherever um, to justify and help um, encourage training and adoption of linked data. So, um, you know, what, what we've committed to is meeting libraries where they are today. Um, and that can be a library across any three of those categories I just talked about. Um, but then to um, really make make the meeting folks where they are today tangible. Um, see, these are for the four um, key criteria that we wanted to be working on um, over the past year and we'll continue working on into the future. Um, and the first is uh, creating global identifiers. Um, so basically a single point of truth for any identifiers that a library is using, we can pull those all together and help sort of redirect folks where they need. I have this identifier, I need that one. Or I have this identifier, give me that other identifier. Um, the second is um, releasing tools to help bridge the gap right now. Um, so early adopters um, are very astute to using things like um, Synopia, um, in some cases Marva, um, but again, you know, other libraries are just not quite there yet for a variety of reasons. Um, so we want to be able to um, support the community by building tools that help bridge this mark link data gap or this um, authority data, uh, bibliographic data gap uh, and things like that. Um, uh, the third bullet is um, be able to import and export WorldCat data, uh, so data into WorldCat as BibFrame. So as libraries start transitioning to BibFrame, they can continue to share their information with the libraries who are still years away from adopting BibFrame. Um, so again, this will help keep you know, everyone um, able to share data um, as they do today, um, but also allow libraries who are interested and willing to um, sort of make that transition tomorrow to BibFrame, um, still be able to collaborate together with libraries around the world. Um, and then the last bullet is, um, you know, as BibFrame has started to grow and build um, support and adoption, there's a variety of different flavors of it. And when I say flavors, I mean sort of formats or variations or constructions of the BibFrame data. Um, and this is very similar to what, um, what we faced in the early days of MARC as well. Um, and it's still, there's quite a few different formats of MARC floating around and being used widely around the world. Um, and the same is true with BibFrame, and it will continue to be true with BibFrame into the foreseeable future. So what we want to um, really focus on as it relates to that is being able to evaluate and adapt um, and adopt different flavors of BibFrame and be able to share them again sort of seamlessly um, across libraries uh, around the world. So that's sort of what we are uh, have been striving for over the past uh, year or so, and will continue to strive through into the future. Um, but now I'd like to sort of take a step and talk about how we're taking these sort of abstract bullet points and actually making them concrete. Um, so the first sort of category I want to talk about is identifiers in library workflows. So um, starting back in November of last year and continuing up through actually right now, 
Um, we've been taking uh, WorldCat entity identifiers, which are identify WorldCat entities is a set of data for people, places, events, organizations, and places. So it's not the bibliographic resource itself, but rather the things that are critical to describing bibliographic resources. Um, so we've started to take these identifiers from WorldCat entities and actually add them to records in WorldCat, um, just adding them as subfield one identifiers. Um, if you're interested in WorldCat entities, you can follow that link there and sort of start browsing and searching around it. Um, thus far, we've added about 400 million of these WorldCat entity identifiers to WorldCat records. Um, and what this does is for those libraries who want to start using linked data in their workflows, but aren't ready to make the jump to bid frame, um, these WorldCat entity identifiers are all linked data. Um, so you can start to, even in your mark-based system, key off of these subfield one linked data identifiers for data analysis across your, your system um, to help build out knowledge cards or improvements in your end user discovery system and for, uh, and for other such workflows. So um, it wouldn't be a presentation of mine unless I had some JSON LD in it. Um, so this is just a quick snippet of um, the data that's delivered back uh, with, from one of those WorldCat entity identifiers. Um, so the data is all freely available um, as JSON-LD for reuse in data management systems, discovery systems, other, other workflows and use cases at libraries. Um, and we spent a lot of time on this JSON-LD to ensure that it's being published following best practices to optimize developer friendliness and reuse of the data. And a lot of these um, sort of um, best practices have been adopted from um, other library communities like uh, the IIIF community. Um, and just to go over a quick few of them, um, you know, things like um, for the uh, place of birth, you know, if a property could be a list, always make it a list. Again, these are developer friendly um, sort of enhancements. Um, just the keywords in general in the JSON-LD data, I and mean, this is all 100% linked data. Um, but we've used sort of conventions and best practice in JSON-LD to make the what would otherwise be a, a URI for date of birth just a keyword in the JSON data. Um, and then also things like language mapping um, properties that can have a variety of different languages or scripts associated with them. Um, so again, this was sort of done purposely for the reasons of making it developer friendly and as easy as possible to reuse for folks who don't understand all the intricacies or details of RDF or linked data. So um, with those identifiers, uh, you can get them um, in all MARC records that they've been added to uh, through a variety of different sources um, or options. Um, and basically any way um, one could get a MARC record out of WorldCat, whether that be through Record Manager, Connection, the Metadata API, even uh, Z39.50, um, and also in sort of bulk via Collection Manager, those identifiers are there by default. So you don't need to ask for them or use them as a configuration parameter. They're just gonna be in, in the records um, in any way you would otherwise get them uh, out of WorldCat. Um, the other thing we've done is, um, you know, so we did a bulk load of adding these identifiers to WorldCat records. And we also have a nightly process that will take newly controlled headings and try to look up and add a new WorldCat entity identifier to the, um, to the newly controlled heading across all the records. Um, but we've also baked into or built into um, our, one of our cataloging products, uh, Record Manager, the ability for a cataloger to, while they're editing or creating, doing original cataloging, um, look up um, a heading name, uh, in this case, um, Mixer comma Jeff, um, get back um, live um, results from WorldCat entities, select that entity if it's found, and then add that really long looking URI directly to the record. So you don't need to leave your current cataloging workflow and go off to WorldCat entities and do a search and copy and paste it back into Record Manager. You can just do it all seamlessly from within the Record Manager um, interface. And uh, this is available to um, any any cataloging library um, who can uh, can use Record Manager, which is which is any cataloging library. 
Uh, we are working on building this into um, connection as well. Um, and we should have more about that uh, when that will be happening uh, later this year. Additionally, um, for uh, libraries that are also uh, Meridian users, um, from again, from Record Manager, you can wholly create a new entity. So if you do a search, um, you can't find this person or organization or place or event in WorldCat entities. Um, for, again, from within Record Manager, you can actually create a whole new entity. It'll immediately mint a new identifier and add, like the previous example, add that identifier to the field. Um, and again, these sort of two enhancements to existing tools is to allow libraries who, again, are sort of on the precipice of starting to work with or adopt linked data with tools and services and data um, that still fit within their existing sort of MARC infrastructure. So um, additionally, um, just, uh, just in August, so just a couple months ago, um, we also released uh, Dewey as linked data. Um, so um, Dewey uh, is a classification system I'm, I'm sure if most folks are familiar with. Um, Dewey's actually been translated into um, six different languages. So uh, English, German, French, Italian, Norwegian, and Swedish. Um, and we've been able to pull together all of those translations and create a single identifier uh, for a Dewey class um, and then publish that data um, for reuse in local discovery systems, like with our um, WorldCat entities URIs, we're going to start adding these Dewey URIs to um, OE2 fields in the Mark Bibliographic Records. Um, we also work very closely with one of our research scientists to um, take these Dewey identifiers and connect them to um, uh, fast topical headings. So um, you know, what this then allows for in terms of data reuse is hop from a, a broad Dewey classification URI down to a more granular, typically granular fast topical heading, and then back up to another potentially wildly different broad Dewey classification. Um, so you know, just having this data all stitched together in a semantic relation, in a set of semantic relationships, really, really broadens the the reuse um, and sort of um, enabling that sort of you know the the panacea of sort of serendipitous discovery. Um, it gets us a little bit closer to that because it actually semantically stitches together um, either Dewey's to Dewey's or Dewey's to Fast um, to allow for that sort of information navigation and retrieval. Um, again, because uh, I was formerly an engineer, um, this is just an example of what you get back uh, when you'd request um, RDF data or data from a Dewey URI. Again, it follows all those sort of best practices I talked about for WorldCat Entities JSON LD. Um, you can see the variety of different uh, languages here. So human readable labels, uh, which I think is also very unique because Dewey numbers, in this case, you know, 025.316, to an end user, that's kind of meaningless. Like, what does that mean? Other than go to the shelf that has that number and then walk down the shelf and you'll eventually find the thing you're looking for. Um, but with the linked data, um, you can actually pull back in a discovery user interface a, a human readable label. Um, there's, the user's gonna still need the number to go find the book, but at least they understand like what, what does that number even mean to begin with? Um, and then also you can see here that related match to the FAST identifier as well. Um, so again, um, all of this Dewey link data is available. Um, you can start to you know, browse it um, and things like that and explore it. And then, um, yeah, and then see, see how, um, how we're gonna start to integrate it into not only WorldCat records, but also into um, some of the user discovery uh, experiences like WorldCat.org and, and WorldCat Discovery. So uh, lastly, as it relates to sort of data is sort of underlying um, all of the WorldCat entities data um, and some of the, the Dewey link data is um, a data model uh, that we've created here uh, that we call the WorldCat ontology. Um, and like um, the conversations we were having with libraries to understand where they are and what challenges they're facing, um, we spent a lot of time uh, working with libraries on the WorldCat ontology to make sure that the the scope of all the use cases that you have across an entire library 
are accounted for as much as possible in the singular sort of World Cat Ontology data model. So um, again, working not only with live uh, cataloging uh, catalogers to understand sort of the authority control use cases and necessities, um, which are for all intents and purposes covered very well in, in formats like the Mark Authority format, um, but also working with researcher information management libraries to understand when you are interested in Jeff Mixter, uh, the person, what aspects or attributes of Jeff Mixter do you care about? And you typically, what they would say are things like, if he was a student here, what, what department did he study under? What school was that part of? Who was his academic advisor, if he had an academic advisor? You know, these are sort of the use cases or re data reuse use cases that researcher information management librarians have. And so what we were able to do is pull all these common use cases for a person or an organization or a place or an event together and develop um, this work at ontology to sort of help encompass all of those use cases. Um, and this is um, um, all freely available. You can download the, the OWL um, ontology if you feel so um, from that link there. Um, there's also a wide set of documentation uh, and a primer uh, document that's available. Um, and this is an ongoing project, so we are continuing to expand it um, just at the beginning of this year, late last year, um, in collaboration with our research division, we um, underwent a, a, a large uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion review of the ontology, working with um, lived experts and um, academic experts in DEI um, to make sure that um, you know, we've spent a lot of time in, in fixing metadata or metadata remediation to make sure that it, the data aligns with our beliefs um, as a library community. Um, but if the model is still problematic, um, it's kind of like you're know, fixing your house, but still having a rotten foundation. Um, you know, so we really wanted to make sure that the foundation of this Royal Cat Entities data, um, in this case, the ontology, uh, was in alignment um, with everything, uh, all the other great work we were doing to help improve um, the quality of, of metadata itself. So um, in addition to um, the data and integrating this data into existing workflows and services and, and metadata, um, you know, we've also developed new tools. So we need new tools for this new data. So uh, in May of this year, uh, we launched uh, OCLC Meridian, uh, which is a web application and a set of APIs to create, curate, and connect together data within the WorldCat Entities Knowledge Graph. Um, so you can find more information there if you're interested. Um, but as I mentioned, it does have sort of an intuitive sort of web-based user interface that we did an extensive development partner testing with, with a wide variety of libraries from around the world. Um, and it also has a set of APIs. Um, and these APIs are all matched to uh, use cases we heard during the development partner testing phase of Meridian. So they include sort of obvious things like searching, um, editing, you know, managing, um, but also sort of more um, nuanced things for specific use cases. So hit lookup is a basically a identifier interchange API. I have a V off, give me the ISNI. I have an ORCID, give me the World Cat entity. So it's a quick, so when you have data has different identifiers across it, you can really quickly try to narrow down and pull um, the identifiers together. Um, and then the Entity Changes API is uh, basically a change feed. Um, so in the previous uh, presentation, they talked about Library of Congress's um, change API that's being used. Um, if I understood it correctly, but it is the API I'm thinking about. Um, this is modeled off of the um, W3C Activity Streams API, which was then adopted by the LD4 community, which turned into um, the Entity Management API, which is basically a way to um, signal changes, an update, a delete, a create, uh, things like that. So we've adopted um, the model created by um, the Entity Management API working group through LD4 um, as a way to publish changes to the WorldCat Entities uh, data. Um, then additionally, uh, we have some other APIs um, for um, really for discovery reuse. So a query API is basically a Sparkle endpoint. Um, the connections API 
um, allows you to give the API an identifier. And then based on all of the connections in WorldCat, based on those 400-ish million um, identifiers we've added to WorldCat records, um, this pulls those all together and will show you, if you provide a person, URI, let's say, um, people that that person has written with, people that have written about that person, people that that person has written about, topics they've written about, events they've written about, events that they are sort of co-subjects about. So maybe Abraham Lincoln and the American Civil War, um, in that it's a book about the Civil War, and Abraham Lincoln's also a primary subject in that book. So it's an interesting way to sort of build out relationships to an entity. Um, but importantly, all of those relationships are um, access points in bibliographic records. So unlike having a relationship, um, let's say, to, to something that's in an outside knowledge graph, uh, which might be a dead end for a user if they click on it, because there won't necessarily be any bibliographic resources associated with that sort of related place or related person, um, it's 100% guaranteed that all of the relationships that get delivered back uh, through this connections API have at least um, one bibliographic record in WorldCat that they're related to. So it can really help better integrate the knowledge card browsing experience into an end user discovery experience. So um, lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about BibFrame as well. Um, you know, this, all of this has sort of been other identifiers, sort of contextual linked data, the data that provides you know, like the context to bibliographic records. Um, but we also have been working very closely with the community on, on BibFrame support. So um, as of today, uh, libraries can uh, provide BibFrame data to through WorldCat. Um, and um, because Library of Congress has been making a lot of updates and changes to their mapping, um, mark to bid frame, bid frame to mark mappings, uh, we've been actively keeping up on those changes. Um, so we currently support Library of Congress's 2.6 uh, conversion specifications. Um, and probably within the next week or so, uh, we'll be done with the 2.7 conversion specifications as well, just to make sure that we are sort of in lockstep with Library of Congress's most up-to-date versions of mark to bid frame and bid frame to mark. Um, we've also uh, tested ingest uh, from both the Library of Congress, um, as well as data that's been created through Synopia and then, then shared uh, via Alma. So uh, we just wrapped up a work with um, UC Davis um, and we're gonna hopefully be working with another library here in the near future. Um, and so if there are any other libraries um, who are, um, creating bid frame from scratch or have a way to convert existing mark records to bid frame and they'd like to test uh, that with us as well, um, please certainly feel free to uh, reach out. Um, and what this testing has done is it's allowed us to sort of expand mappings based on differences in bid frame structure um, and data, um, whether that be across data providers or services, so Library of Congress versus um, UC Davis or Synopia versus Marva, um, and really expand the, the amount or the, the structure and types of bid frame that we can ingest. Um, and we've also been able to share this feedback back with libraries um, as well as library vendors to help improve the overall interoperability of bid frame um, across the library ecosystem. Um, to complement um, ingest, uh, we're also working on export. So um, what we've been doing here is we we started with Library of Congress's mark to bid frame conversions. Um, and what we're doing now is um, evaluating mark fields that are not accounted for in the Library of Congress's mark to bid frame conversion. And uh, the way we're doing that is um, sort of looking at WorldCat as an aggregate and looking across that aggregate um, to evaluate mark fields that have very, very high uses across WorldCat, but aren't um, currently accounted for in Library of Congress's conversion specifications. So this sort of help provide sort of these are really high profile fields that are used for, um, you know, at a, at a specific institution, um, at a, a consortial level, at a country level, at a regional level. Um, that in most cases, they're just not standard mark fields that Library of Congress catalogs in. Um, so it's sort of, you know, Library of Congress is a 
you know, broadly speaking, a very homogeneous set of um, cataloging practices. Um, that's simply not the case when you look at something like WorldCat. So we've been looking at the wide variety, the extremely heterogeneous set of data in WorldCat to help improve that uh, mark to bid frame mapping. Um, so as a result, so we expanded the mapping to account for these very highly frequently used fields and in most cases, field subfield combinations. Um, and the other thing we've been doing is addressing a variety of identifiers found across MARC data. Um, so there's actually just an email um, thread yesterday on the bid frame listserv about um, a bid frame field that was created, a link that was created from a, the mark to bid frame conversion, but that link was not actually a resolvable link. Um, and it certainly wasn't an identifier, it was not a URI. Um, so again, because of the wide variety of different stuff um, that gets put into, um, let's say in particular 8xx fields and mark records, um, a generic, I just always assume that a, the, the thing in this field is going to be a link, um, a URI, a resolvable link um, is, is questionable at best. Um, so again, to provide the highest fidelity, most usable set of bid frame data, we wanna do rigorous testing on these identifiers and understand are these identifiers that take you off to an electronic article that's behind a paywall? Um, are they just you know, dead, no longer valid URLs? Are they actually valid URLs? Are they URIs by chance? Um, so that's sort of the analysis we're doing as it relates to that. Um, and then um, ultimately we're doing sort of at scale testing to evaluate the quality of exported bid frame from WorldCat um, compared to the bid frame that's natively contributed to WorldCat. So we can sort of compare apples to apples. Um, we're also uh, working on a bid frame editor. Um, this editor will be uh, will allow uh, catalogers to work seamlessly uh, between uh, mark based editors um, and bid frame. Um, so you could hop into Record Manager, create a mark record, save that mark record, hop over to the bid frame editor, find that work instance item uh, correspondence, and then add a new subject to it. Save that off. Save the work off in that case jump back to record manager, pull that record back up and see that new subject that was added. Um, so again, this will help sort of uh, with that um, transition period uh, between mark and bid frame. Um, we just wrapped up our second round of user testing um, and uh, are really interested by the results we found. It was sort of evaluating um, sort of mental models um, for catalogers in terms of how they understand bid frame and what their workflows would be for creating, uh, you know, describing a wholly new material in bid frame versus describing um, just the um, ebook um, version of a material. Um, so we plan on rolling all those findings into our development. Uh, we plan on starting development partner testing uh, sometime in 2025. Um, and a critical component of this bid frame editor will be tight integration with um, OCLC Meridian. Um, as I sort of talked about integrating with Record Manager, um, Meridian will be um, a cornerstone to the bid frame editor for creating, editing, and managing um, sort of authoritative type of entities. Um, and then lastly, um, I want to talk just about bid frame data. Um, so uh, myself and another colleague, Kirk Hess, are working with the PCC Bid Frame Interoperability Group, or the BIG group, um, to evaluate bid frame at scale. Um, and we've been looking at that across WorldCat. And what we have found is that idiosyncratic practices in MARC um, result in exponentially larger idiosyncratic realities in bid frame. Um, and that can in and of itself cause um, interoperability problems. Um, there's, there's also this there are different flavors of bid frame I talked about earlier um, is, is also problematic. Um, and so basically the, you know, the, the data that's created as bid frame can, wild bear, can vary wildly based on the bid frame editors that are being used, um, the way the data is exported or managed by those editors. Um, and all of this ultimately decreases the reusability of the data at scale um, and compromises interoperability um, across libraries. And we obviously don't want that. So 
Um, we are working to help um, evaluate this at the WorldCast scale and in groups like the PCC Big Group are looking at it sort of holistically across the library domain um, to really help set the standard for interoperability as libraries start to transition to a more linked data, big frame first um, um, management process. Um, so ultimately what we are doing is uh, we're working uh, towards creating a highly reliable, consistent uh, and developer friendly set of bid frame data. Um, and to do that, we are looking at how to normalize patterns across the data, um, adopt best practices for publishing linked data, um, and working very, very closely with the Library of Congress to ensure that ingest and export mappings um, that we have for WorldCat are up to date with the most recent Library of Congress specifications. So um, next steps, um, or what are we doing over the next year? Um, we are going to be doing some data enrichment. Um, so we're going to be add, currently we're adding WorldCat entity organization URIs to WorldCat. Um, I mentioned we'll be adding do we link data identifiers to WorldCat records. Um, we're continuing to update the WorldCat entity data itself. Um, so since we launched Meridian in May, we've added um, about 86 million, I think it was a 90 million now, additional claims to the WorldCat entities data. So it's very much a living, breathing data set that we are continually enhancing and, and contributing to. Um, and we'll also be uh, continuing our different data analysis and refinement. Um, so if folks are interested, um, I guess there's a QR code, there's a link there as well. If anyone's interested in uh, participating in one of our BitFrame Editor um, um, UI UX testing sessions, um, please, please reach out. Um, this just takes you off to a form to fill out. Um, and again, uh, thank you everyone so much for the time. Um, I think there's maybe a few minutes for questions, uh, but again, thank you for the, the invitation and the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, we got three questions so far. Um, let me get this third one posted in the chat there so we can get there. Okay, question one was, are you recording name headings for uncontrolled headings to actual LC map headings so you aren't creating multiple world cat entities for the same person? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, so a WorldCat entity uh, will connect out to um, a wide variety of both semantic data sets like LCNAF or Wikidata or ISME, as well as non-semantic data sets. So authority files that are not quite public, not yet published as linked data. So yes, we are not creating duplicates in WorldCat entities um, and the identifiers we add to WorldCat um, are always connected to the authority controlled heading of the of that field. Sorry, I'm putting on the first. Okay, question number two. This is more for me because I'm curious about it. Um, one, uh, you were talking about the mark to bid frame, um, and I came from catalog, and so that was pretty exciting to me. Um, you said you were working with different libraries and vendors. Is this a service that you guys are doing for free or is it a subscription? And then can you give us kind of some of the vendors you've done it with currently? You don't have to give us all of them, just throw out yeah. some. Yeah, so we're still working on the Mark II bid frame. Um, so we are testing it, um, but the bid frame to Mark, so the ingest process, um, we've worked very closely with um, a couple of Alma libraries. Uh, just because Alma does have sort of um, bid frame support in it uh, via Synopia. Um, so, um, and it is it is free. Yeah, if you want to test taking bid frame you have at your library and, and getting it into WorldCat, um, you know, we, we are able to um, duplicate check them as well. So just in case the WorldCat record, the mark record's already there. We're not, you know, creating a duplicate mark record based on this new bid frame. So, you know, all of the um, ingest expectations, setting holdings on things that you would expect from just doing it natively in Mark um, are supported in bid frame. And again, more than more than willing to chat with anyone and you know any um, any or library wanting to to test and evaluate that with us. Great. Okay, this question came from Slack. Are you working with all bid frame entities or doing in the near future, particularly item descriptions and hub data? 
Have you looked at the arm extension? Very important that rare material descriptions have a place to go in convergence, as well as a place to provide full enough descriptions using those rules. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. So um, right now we are our Bitframe editor will be um, using obviously native Bitframe. Um, it will include the um, LC a uh, VFLC namespace as well, um, just for sort of back office type of stuff. Um, but we have been looking at um, extension um, ontologies as well. Uh, most recently, we we're looking at the perform music ontology for describing um, sort of musical type of resources. Um, the um, the ARM one is something that I'm, I'm familiar with, but I just haven't investigated it recently. But yes, we understand that for um, for a, overcoming some of the problematic things in Mark that make it challenging to describe certain sets of materials, ontologies outside of just BibFrame, um, which is really to derive from Mark, um, need to be accounted for. Um, and then in terms of hubs and items, uh, we have been working closely with Library of Congress to understand exactly what a hub represents. Um, so I think we will be integrating it, but we just need to understand the use cases for hubs. Because not only are there hubs, but then uh, ShareBD has an opus idea. Um, there's also then you can cut over outside of different altogether and start talking about WEMI works and how does that relate to a hub. So uh, we want to... Um, understand the use cases to best provide the data needed to libraries. Um, and then for different items, um, those are those are interesting. Well, we will have them, obviously, but we're also looking at um, sort of when we think of an item, looking at characteristics of an item that are outside the context of a marked bibliographic record, holdings, local bibliographic data, things like that. Um, they just don't fit in the bid frame at all right now. Um, how can we account for those? Because again, those are sort of critical data models or data components to libraries workflows. Thank you. <clears throat> Bob said on social media venues for catalogs like Autocrat and TCMMF Facebook groups, I've seen some reluctance to take those dollar sign one identifiers seriously. Maybe you can suggest some examples or ways in which libraries can take advantage of those identifiers so the uninitiated can see benefits. Yeah, that's a great question. So we we are working right now um, in our discovery um, solutions to start to integrate the use of these identifiers in them, sort of show the best you know best way to show to demonstrate values to show it yourself. Um, but um, you know, I think the other ones that you know we've talked with libraries about are are just using the data. I mean, those are, those links in the mark record can be resolved to get back linked data. Um, that's multilingual most of the time, so it can help improve discovery systems. Um, those identifiers can also be indexed. Um, so, you know, Jane Austen, it, you know, is Jane Austen in you know almost every Latinized language, but Jane Austen in Cyrillic Russian or in Hebrew or in Arabic is definitely not the same string as Jane Austen, which means um, you have a lot of well, if you have a large set of data that's multilingual. Um, you have quite a few Jane Austen strings, even controlled Jane Austen strings floating around. So, um, but if you have an identifier for Jane Austen, you can index those identifiers in sort of that you know, traditional like um, recall precision paradigm we talk about in information retrieval. Um, you can have extremely high precision um, and much less recall by doing an identifier-based search as opposed to a string-based search across index data. Um, but I, I certainly do understand you. I've talked with a lot of librarians who have that same sentiment. And you know, when a library doesn't control its end-user discovery experience, um, you know, the, the notion of them just using the linked data to improve their end-user discovery situation is not particularly um, resonating, doesn't resonate particularly well. Um, and also if you don't have the ability to manage what data is indexed uh, across the mark records, that can also be problematic. Um, but the, um, you know, in general, we're really starting to push um, those types of things into WorldCat indexing, um, discovery, WorldCat.org to help sort of show through example 
uh, you can start to use um, those otherwise admittedly very odd looking URLs in MARC records. Does anybody else have any questions? You can post them in chat or in Slack. If you are on chat or on the Zoom call, you can even unmute and ask Jeff yourself. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed this. I love crosswalks. Yeah, I love watching how things talk to each other and communicate and we're looking at um, potential migration. So looking into that is gonna be super cool. Let's see. I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. And that is our time. Um, I'm sure Jeff will be in Slack and um, in the next one, um, maybe for a little while, if you guys have any questions. Um, and at this point, we're getting ready to go to our midday break. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Thank you, everyone. I appreciate the time. My pleasure. And um, Christine is going to post, or Christy is going to post a link in Slack and in our chat um, for the next session. When we come back from break, it's going to be a new Zoom meeting. So if you want to go ahead and click on it after this one, you can copy it. First, we want to say thank you to our presenters today and this great information. And a special thank you to Jessica and Ryan for all the extra information they've been putting into Slack and into chat for each of these sessions. And then um, I would like to say thank you to Christy as my co-host. You guys have a wonderful break. Remember that Slack is there waiting for you. We have the social channel and then also the conference channel. Enjoy your break and we will see you guys back in about 15 minutes. Have a wonderful day, guys.